Well, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to our evening service. And before I forget, I bring you greetings from Shrewsbury Gospel Hall. Uh, we had a, a meeting this morning. A um, few less than attending here tonight, but uh, we're still keeping going and we, we still hold family services. We, we still have a craft. Uh, on Monday afternoon, so if anyone's free on Monday afternoon, um, first and third Mondays, you're most welcome to come along. And that, that's tomorrow, of course, because it will be one tomorrow as well. The psalmist David says this in Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My boast will be in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So that's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to praise the Lord. We're going to worship together. And let's sing our opening hymn, which is, For the friend we have in Jesus. Father, the hymn writer has exhorted us many times to take it to the Lord in prayer. Whatever it may be, but why can we take it to the Lord? Because you are the Almighty God, the creator of this world, the creator of the universe, creator of mankind and the one who provided a saviour because the Lord we, we can praise you your, your creation was, was perfect as we read through the opening verses of, of the book of Genesis we see there how you created the world in order and each time the verdict was good. And yet, O oh Lord, even man's creation was good, but we 
I saw it sad to read very quickly that man rebelled against you. Well, Father, as we come together this evening, we can still praise you. David said, I will extol the Lord at all times. Whatever situation we're in, we can praise you, we can worship you. And Father, he calls us to exalt your name together as a group of people who come to worship you. And even in that perfect creation when man fell, you provided a way of salvation. You promised your son. And the Father, we just praise and worship you for your mercy, for your grace, for your love for each one of us and for this world. Lord, there are, there are many tonight, O oh Lord, who are just ignoring you, having nothing to do with you, are rejecting you. But whatever man does, you are still God. You still call for worship from our lips to praise you. And so, Father, we ask that as we do that, as we sing these hymns, as we look into your word, as we remember you with the communion service part. Lord, we give you our thanks. We bring you our praise in that precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's Exodus 14, starting at verse 7, and that's page 71 on the church Bible. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they encamped by the sea near Pi Heroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and to die in the desert. <coughs> Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and it's only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of the Lord, who had been travelling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so that neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud 
of the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off, so they had difficulty driving. The Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites, the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to his place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh had been following the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Now shall we pray again? Almighty God, as we come to you again in prayer, we bring to you those who are in need at this time. Lord, we bring especially of Diane. Lord, we just pray that she might recover, that she might be given the right medication, the right guidance from the doctors, and that she might be restored to her to her health and be able to come back and join again in the fellowship here. You with her and this fa her family at this time, Lord, is they without her are worried about her and just as we are concerned for her, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you will give her peace. You will give her assurance that you are in control. We thank you that we can come and bring her to you. Lord, you know all the others that are on our prayer list here for today. Lord, you know each one of them and their individual needs. Lord, whatever it is, we pray that you might meet that need, that you will answer it, and we will give you the praise and the glory. The Lord, as we look out beyond our immediate fellowship here, we pray for this community of Great Waker. Lord, we pray that the Christian witness in this village might continue to be strong, that we might continue to reach out into the lives of those that live in this community, that you will speak to them, that, Lord, they might be challenged about their relationship with you. But Lord, we, we cannot but think tonight of the world situation. And Lord, we think of the situation in Ukraine. Lord, each day we hear of disasters and atrocities that are happening. Lord, lives that are being lost. Lord, buildings that are being destroyed where people are sheltering. Lord, we just pray for peace between those two nations. Pray that the Russians may withdraw and Ukraine will be able to rebuild their, their country. And Lord, we know that there is so much devastation. Lord, we, we cannot understand why, why man wants to do this. And yet in one sense we know that man is sinful and, and wants everything for themselves. Lord, so often we're reading your word in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Judges, that everyone did that which was right in their own eyes, with no regard for anyone else. Lord, we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in, in Ukraine. Lord, we know that many of the pastors are refusing to leave because they want to stay and to help those that they can. Lord, bless them at this time. Give them the assurance that the world is praying for them. Lord, we just commit them into your care. 
we pray that the leaders of the nations might put so much pressure that this situation would be resolved quickly. And then Lord, we just pray for ourselves tonight that you will speak to us. Lord, as we look at this story from the Old Testament, we see your hand at work, preserving and protecting. And Lord, we just give you thanks for incidents like this, it gives us the assurance that you are in control and that you can guide and direct each one of us. So we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I suppose what, uh, when you think about what's going on in Ukraine, we get very depressed, don't we? And, uh, we get worried about what's happening, what's the implications for us. And so before we just look at this little story from the Old Testament, little story, big story, isn't it, from the Old Testament, let's sing another hymn. And that says, who, who can cheer the heart? We need cheering up today as we look at the world situation. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? Let's stand and sing.
the Israelites would have asked a question. Why are we here? Why are we facing this problem? Why have we got the Red Sea in front of us and the Egyptian army behind us? Why am I facing this? What about you tonight? Do you have problems? Sometimes they, they seem insurmountable. As, as we look around at the world situation, we, we thought of Russia and Ukraine. Where will it end? When will it end? And what will be the outcome? In one sense, that seems to be a long way away from us, doesn't it? On the other hand, it's having an effect in this country. <coughs> Our economy is in trouble. Prices are rising. We, even, we were in Norfolk uh, last weekend. We, we drove past a garage in, in, on one of the main roads and they were selling diesel at 1.99 a litre. It's cheaper as I believe. <laughs> I hope so. But how do we find the money to pay these prices? Gas is going up, electricity is going up, inflation is, is rampant, and wages don't seem to be rising to match it. How will we cope? Those are practical problems that we're looking at. Have you ever faced a seemingly impossible situation? Have you personal issues that are difficult? Who have you turned to? Have you ever asked God to help? Because that's what we see in our story. We see how God intervened. God came into that situation. I'll tell you a little story. Don't know how true it is. But George had been in Sunday school. And he came home and his mum said, Well, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And he said, No, we learned about Moses and the people crossing the Red Sea. Oh, she said, What was happened? He said, Well, it was like this. Moses got to the Red Sea, they saw the, Israel the Israelites were there, and they looked behind and they saw the Egyptian armies coming. So Moses said, right, get the engineers together. And the engineers came and they built a bridge across the Red Sea. And they said, the Israelites all got on the bridge, and they all ran across the Red Sea and they got to safety the other side. Then what happened, she said. Oh, well, he said, uh, Moses got on his Wi-Fi and called up the Air Force and they sent typhoons down and when the Egyptians were on the bridge trying to get across, they blasted them and they all died. And she said to George, I don't think that's what you were taught in Sunday school. No, he said, but if I told you what really happened, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> but it happened. Just as we read it. What was the scenario? The Israelites, they were traveling from Egypt to a new home. God was guiding them. And they had a cloud and a pillar of fire. And they got to the Red Sea. How could they cross it? Well, first of all, they didn't have time to think about it and plan, really. Because they could see in the distance the Egyptian army coming. And so who did they turn to? Well, they blamed Moses, didn't they? 
I think uh, the reaction of the children of Israel on this occasion reminds me of Fraser in Dad's army. Doomed, doomed, we're all doomed. And, and they argued with Moses and said, look, did you bring us here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt for us to be buried in? We were better off in Egypt. How quickly they had forgotten. Because they've been moaning in Egypt, haven't they? They've been crying out to God to get us out of this place. And they, they've forgotten, haven't they? They'd forgotten how God had acted. He hadn't just released them from Egypt. He'd sent ten plagues to convince the Egyptians to let them go. Finding that they'd gone with their flocks, their treasures. Had God just brought them from one bad situation to another. Look at what they were facing. Have you ever really thought about what it, what it really meant? <clears throat> In front of them was the Red Sea. And where historians believe, uh, and Bible students believe they were crossing, it was about three miles wide, which is quite an expanse. But they had no mean of crossing. They hadn't built a three mile bridge in those days, so they couldn't go across. Behind them, as they looked back, they could see the dust from the chariots of the Egyptians coming to take them back into Egypt because the Egyptians suddenly realized all the workers had gone. And the Egyptians had enjoyed themselves. They could sit back and do nothing because the Israelites had been doing all the building for them. And suddenly their labor force has gone. It must have been a moment of madness, the Egyptian king thought, Pharaoh said, that we've let them go. When you think about the people for us next thing, so you've got this three bar gap to get across that was water. How many people were there? Well, conservative estimates reckon about 2 million. A lot of people. How do you imagine 2 million people? Well, think of them as a block. Suppose they were 500 people wide across the block. To fit in your 2 million, it would be about 4,000 people long, plus the animals. So it was about a mile wide and four miles long. You wouldn't fit it into Wakering High Street. You wouldn't fit it on South End Seafront, even being a city. No. There was this great mass of people trying to get away. So what do they do? They've turned on Moses, haven't they? Where do we turn when we get into difficult situations? Do we blame the nearest person to us? Do we blame our friends? Do we blame somebody else? It's always somebody else anyway, isn't it? It's not our fault. Do we blame God? This is what the children of Israel did. And they turn on Moses. And Moses accepts, doesn't he, that he must do something. But who can he turn to? He turns to God. He recognizes that God has guided them to this point. And Moses tells them, look, God is still in control. You're not going to have to fight the Egyptians. He will do it for you. All you've got to do, he said, is to be still and watch. God, have you ever tried doing that? You're facing an awful situation. It's constantly changing and God is saying to us, stand still and watch. 
the psalmist says, doesn't he, be still and know that I am God. And this is what Moses told the people of Israel to do. What happens next? But it's an absolute miracle. Remember the story I told you about that boy in Sunday school? In human terms, what happened next was unbelievable. God protects his people. He'd been leading them with the pillar of clouds by day and the fire by night. And so what does he do? He puts that cloud and fire between his people and the Egyptians. And there was darkness. There was darkness behind them. But in front of them, there was light. And, and they could see the sea. That may not have been very reassuring. The Egyptians couldn't see us, but we still can see the problem. And Moses stretches out his hand and his staff over the sea, and God sends an east wind. Notice it's a specific wind from the east. He tells us where it comes from. And it blows so hard that the waters of the Red Sea part and there appears to be a dry channel through the middle and these pillars or the walls of water on either side. Absolutely amazing. Better than a bridge, isn't it? But you know, they still had to accept that they had faith in God and walk between those two walls of water. There must have been those who, I would say, ran through because they were worried that the water might come back. What if the wind stops blowing when we're halfway through? But God was in control. And they walk through the gap. Now remember our picture of the block of people. If it was only three miles wide and the, the, the group was at least four or five miles long, some were on the other side before others had even started. And they went on through. They came out on the far side in the Sinai area. Now the Egyptians, of course, were, uh, they could see now what was happening. God lifted the cloud and they could see. And they could see this gap. And they could see their slaves disappearing into the distance. And so they rush after them. They didn't worry about the waters coming back. They thought, we're going to get through. We've got chariots. We're going to race through. And God intervenes again. I like the way it's recorded in the Bible that God uh, upset them and disturbed them and their wheels came off so it was difficult to drive. If the wheels come off your car it's almost impossible to drive, isn't it? And here are these men in their chariots. I suppose they bounced along a little bit on their axles as the horses were trying to drag these chariots across this gap. They realized now that there was a greater power at work and they tried to turn around and get out. A um, bit of a problem uh, because the wheels have come off your chariots, how are you going to turn them around? and escape. As if God said, I've had enough blowing of this wind, let's stop it. And God stopped blowing. God stopped the wind. 
and those walls of water resume their natural flow. The whole army of Egypt drowned. These lights on the other side, they stand and look in amazement. God has intervened again. They're safe from the attack of the Egyptians. They're safe from slavery. Their problem has been solved by God. All they had to do was trust. Do you know, if God can do such miracles as we've just seen, your problem has a solution. And God can give it to you. But first, you need to trust God. Explain your problem. And watch and see how he solves it for you. Think of some of the incidents in the New Testament where people came to Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do? The blind man says, I want to see. The lame man, I want to walk. They had to come to God and explain what their problem was. And Jesus dealt with their problems. And sometimes the solution may not be what we expect. God acts in many ways and in different methods. Would you have parted the Red Sea? To, or would you have said, well, the answer is, let's have a bolt from heaven and destroy the Egyptian army. If God had done that, Israel would have still been on the wrong side of the Red Sea, wouldn't they? God gave them a complete solution, his solution to their problem. And God gives us so many examples in the Bible how he dealt with problems. How was he going to save Noah from the flood? How did he do it? He said, build a boat. There was a widow who had a debt problem in Elisha's time. What did he tell her? He didn't say, right, you know, somebody will give you the money. No, take that little bit of oil you've got and keep pouring and keep pouring. And then you can sell it and you can solve that problem. How would David kill his Goliath? A sling and a stone. Not by military might. He trusted in God. And there are many more examples, aren't there, that we can look to that gives us that assurance. And I say to you tonight, if you're facing a problem, bring it to the Lord. Let him deal with it. But I must warn you, you need to be prepared for his solution to your issue. And it might not be what you would expect. We learn from this passage this evening that we can trust God. He never fails. And he's true today as he was on the banks of the Red Sea. He will make a way for each one of us. He's made a way, hasn't he, for us to come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. We remembered already his death and his suffering so that we might have life and we have to trust him. How strong is your trust in God tonight? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful miracle that you performed in releasing your people so they could cross to the other side. And you destroyed the, the problem that they were facing. You were in control. Lord, at times they doubted you, but each time they came back to you. Lord, perhaps we have a bit like them. We doubt. We perhaps try to, to solve our problems ourselves. 
Lord, we, we need to turn to you. We need to trust you. Because through Jesus you have solved our greatest problem. Sin that separates us from you. That we can have salvation. That we can know Jesus tonight as our own personal saviour. Lord, help us to build our trust and dependence on you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Closing him, it could be anything else, but I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee, trusting thee for full, full salvation, great and free. the love of God and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.